Father, we're grateful for today, grateful for this morning, uh, grateful for the nice weather, <clears throat> and grateful for uh, this Sunday, um, one week after Resurrection Sunday. So you conquered the grave, and <clears throat> you're an overcomer, and if we know you personally, we are overcomers too. So help us uh, to leave this place with that attitude in a world that is basically falling apart from the human perspective and desperately needs this message. We'll be careful to give you all the praise and the glory. We ask these things in Jesus' name. God's people said, Amen. Amen. Well, if you could find in your Bible the book of Revelation, chapter 6, and verses 16 and 17. As you know, we're continuing on with our teaching on the rapture of the church, dealing here with Roman numeral 4, the opposing views. And we are in the process of critiquing what's called pre-wrath rapturism. Uh, We believe that the correct view is at the top of the screen, pre-tribulationalism, but here on the screen are the competing views, and if you look at the very bottom, um, there's something called pre-wrath rapturism, and uh, essentially these people are arguing that the church is going to be here for all of the first half of the tribulation. Aren't you comforted by that, by the way? (laughs) Comfort one another with these words. And then you're going to be here for a lot of the second half also, before the wrath of God starts. And then you have a hope of being raptured out roughly three quarters into it. So uh, um, we have to deal with this because it's sort of a new kid on the block view. It doesn't fit into the typical mid-trib and post-trib camp. And these people, for whatever reason, they're very, very loud. And they pick up a lot of adherents just because they're probably the most aggressive people that I can see today on the horizon um, promoting their perspective. So a lot of times people think, well, they're very loud, so they must be right, right? And I don't think they're right at all. So we have described their view. Um, Their view is articulated in this chart here by Marvin Rosenthal, one of their progenitors. And you'll notice that the first half of the tribulation is just the beginning of sorrows. And then when you get into the second half, part of that is the great tribulation. And essentially what they're trying to say is everything that's happening in those sections is basically the wrath of Satan or the wrath of man. And God's wrath, which they say we are exempted from, and I agree with them at least on that, I agree that we're exempted from God's wrath, we just have a disagreement concerning when it starts. But they're basically saying God's wrath, in other words, the wrath of man and the wrath of Satan doesn't become the wrath of God until, you know, the final 25% of the tribulation, roughly. And so that's what's called pre-wrath rapturism. So what I was doing, and this is our third lesson on this, and I'm sorry to go into all this detail about it, but to uproot um, a weed, it requires some aggressive work. And um, you're not going to, people out there, and, you know, we have an audience not just in this room, but we have an audience online, and so they're kind of looking to us for answers to these things. And, you know, it's one of those things that the book of Proverbs says, one man sounds right until another man cross-examines him. So when you watch their videos, I mean, they sound right, uh, except when you give someone else a chance to critique them. And so that's why I'm taking the time to do this. Uh, There are six problems with their view. And these six problems relate to the arguments that we gave very early in this series on why we believe that the church 
will not be here during the tribulation period. The first problem with their view, and this is review, um, it places the church in the 70th week of Daniel. All of these views, mid-trib, post-trib, pre-wrath, they all do that. And we've tried to say that's problematic because the 70th week of Daniel concerns who? It concerns the nation of Israel. So if the church wasn't here for the first 69 weeks of Daniel's prophecy, why would the church be here for the 70th week of Daniel's prophecy? The second problem with their view, and again, this is review, is it fails, they fail to acknowledge that the church is missing on the earth in Revelation 6 through 19. So they take a lot of passages that really relate to those that are saved after the age of the church is over. They'll see the word saints, for example, and they'll try to turn that into the church. And we went into some detail on that. And our study on this was interrupted last week because we did a two-part study uh, in light of Resurrection Sunday. So you have to go back into your memory banks to remember some of these initial points. But where their view, I think, is very, really, really weak is they are confining God's wrath not just to the second half of the tribulation, but they're conf confining God's wrath to a portion of the second half of the tribulation. And that's why they call their view pre-wrath. Uh, until that final quarter, everything that's happened in the tribulation is allegedly the wrath of man or the wrath of Satan and not the wrath of God. Now here is what we believe is the correct view. We believe that the whole tribulation period is God's wrath. Um, one of the reasons we think that is because you don't have any of these judgments until Jesus is in heaven opening a seven-sealed scroll, which triggers all of these events. So if Jesus is in heaven opening a seven-sealed scroll, triggering not just the seals, not just the trumpets, but also the bowls, we believe the whole enchilada so to speak or a Jewish analogy the whole shawarma is the seven-year tribulation period pre-wrath does not agree with that so in a sense I believe I'm pre-wrath um, but I just believe the wrath starts at the beginning they're pre-wrath in the sense that no pre-wrath doesn't start until roughly three quarters into it so their view is very different than ours. You see how they've confined God's wrath to the final 25%, roughly. As I mentioned, they don't like to be pinned down on the exact date, but all of their charts, not all, but many of their charts, particularly those by Rosenthal, put God's wrath um, towards the end there. And they put the rapture just before God's wrath starts. And then they call God's wrath the day of the Lord. So everything that's happened thus far in the tribulation period is not the day of the Lord. It's not God's wrath. Well, then what is it? It's the beginning of sorrows or the great tribulation, which they say we are candidates for because Jesus told us in John 16, verse 33, in the world you'll have tribulations. And these are, and you say, well, then if they're not God, if these things aren't God's wrath, then what are they? Well, they say that's the wrath of man or the wrath of Satan, but not God's wrath yet. Now, you'll notice here this chart, and I want to draw this to your attention. This, is, this chart comes from one of the adherents of this position. And you'll look at this chart, and there's a lot of it that I agree with, in the sense that he correlates the birth pains of Matthew 24 with the seal judgments of Revelation 6 and 7. And I think that part of it is right. But as you start to move through this, birth pang number one is antichrists, uh, antichrist and false Christs. Birth pain number two is wars. Birth pain number three is famine. 
And essentially what they're arguing is, well, the Antichrist is causing these problems, not God. The wars are caused by man and not God. And the famine is caused by um, uh, Satan or man and not God. And then the martyrdoms, they'll say, are caused by man or Satan and not God. And so you kind of look through this and, you'll, and you see, well, that kind of makes sense. Until you actually look at the details, you'll notice there with birth pain number three, they describe it just as famine. But take a look at Matthew 24, verse 7. That's not what it says. It's not described as just famine. Matthew 24, verse 7 says, For nation will rise up against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines and what? Earthquakes in various places. You see what he left off his list here? He left off earthquakes. Well, why would he do that? Well, I think part of the reason is it's a lot easier to argue that famine is caused by man. Uh, you know, we have in history uh, communists that have starved to death their own populations. Um, I think you can argue that kind of thing's going on even in China. You know, the leaders of China, the leader, he looks like he needs to be on a serious Weight Watchers program. And the rest of the population is starving to death. Um, so you have in history examples where famines are caused by man. But it's sort of hard to argue that an earthquake is caused by man, isn't it? I mean, have you caused any earthquakes lately? Maybe you have metaphorically. But it's, it's hard to argue you have an earthquake device in your house and you push a button and all of a sudden there's an earthquake. So I, it's very interesting to me that he left off earthquakes from his chart here and I have a problem with that because that's not really being honest I mean if you're going to make a chart representative of the Bible then seal judgment number three and birth pang number three needs to see famine needs to say famine and earthquakes he deliberately left it off his chart because it's an easier case in my opinion to make that famine is the work of man rather than the work of God Do you guys follow I'm not the only one that's observed this. Dr. Toussaint says this concerning the pre-wrath view. This means that the earthquakes described in Matthew 24, verse 7, which Rosenthal thinks will occur in the first half of the seven-year area, are the result of the power of Satan or man. Toussaint observes, interestingly, quote, Rosenthal never explains how the earthquakes in Matthew chapter 24 verse 7 are triggered by humans. So what I think is famines and earthquakes are in the first half of the tribulation. Both of them are not caused by man. They're ultimately caused by God because it's Jesus opening a seven sealed scroll in heaven which is triggering these events. But the pre-wrath view wants you to believe that you're going to be here for these things, even though you're promised an exemption from divine wrath. And they argue that because they argue that what is happening in these birth pangs and seal judgments is the wrath of man or the wrath of Satan and not the wrath of God. Sort of hard to argue that when you get to earthquakes. So, so I just bring that to your attention. But notice, if you will, Revelation chapter 6, verses 16 and 17. This is where everything changes in the pre-wrath perspective. And this is where they say the wrath of God at this point is, and they use these fancy words, it's portending, or maybe the word is portrending. And it says this, And they said to the mountains and the rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the sight of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb, for the great day of their wrath has come, and who is able to stand? So finally, at this point in the tribulation period, the wrath of God becomes sort of this ominous specter. Everything, according to their view, that's happened thus far is not the wrath of God. 
so we have to be here for that. But now the wrath of God is sort of this ominous uh, specter. And then they say the wrath of God really doesn't start kicking in until later uh, with the trumpet judgments. So um, seal judgment number one, the advent of the Antichrist, that is not the wrath of God, according to their view. Seal judgment number two, war, that is not the wrath of God. Seal judgment number three, famine, that is not the wrath of God. Seal judgment number four, death of a quarter of the world's population. That is not the wrath of God either. That is the wrath of man and the wrath of Satan that have done these things. Martyrdoms, that is not the wrath of God. Obviously, they think man caused that. And it's not until you get to number six that finally, for the first time, the wrath of God is mentioned. And... I probably misstated it the last time I was with you. I think I made the statement that they believe the wrath of God starts at that point. I don't think I had that exactly right. What they're arguing is that the wrath of God is now portending or portrending or foreshadowing at this point. And the wrath of God is really going to start kicking in with the trumpet judgments. And so that's their logic for saying that we are here for all of these judgments. So here is Marvin Rosenthal uh, in his own words. He says in Revelation 6 verse 17, again the equivalent phrase for the great day of their wrath is come, is aorist, can be demonstrated to have but one meaning. God's day of the Lord's wrath is impending. It is about to happen. It has not yet occurred. And then he says, there is no legitimate way that the phrase, the great day of their wrath has come, in context of Revelation 6 verse 17, can be made retroactive to include the first seal, six seal judgments. Contextually, therefore, once again, God's wrath cannot be understood to include the first six seals. That's why they're very aggressive in saying the church is going to be on the earth for these first six seal judgments. Because the first six seal judgments are not the wrath of God. You don't get the wrath of God until you move into the trumpets. And they think that because the word wrath shows up for the first time in Revelation 6 verses 16 and 17 where they're saying the wrath, the pagans, as they're understanding what's happening, the wrath of God is imminent. The wrath of God is portending or portrending. And they don't take this as a statement looking backward. That's the difference of opinion. They take this as a statement looking forward. See the difference there? And they think they have exegetical grounds for believing that. I do not believe they have exegetical grounds for believing that. And in fact, there's a lot of very fine Greek scholars that disagree with what they're saying. One of them is Robert Thomas, and I've given you this quote before. But here is Robert Thomas's correct assessment of the mention of the wrath of God for the first time in Revelation 6, verses 16 and 17. Thomas says, Mankind in his rebellion correctly analyzes the cosmic and terrestrial disturbances as part of the great end-time day of wrath from the one sitting on the throne from the Lamb. The verb elethon, because that's what the pagans are saying, the wrath of God has come. The verb elethon, has come, is an aorist indicative referring to a previous arrival of divine wrath, not something that is about to take place. The quote goes on and it says, and I won't reread this whole thing to you because I've given you this quote before, but the very end says, the rapid sequence of all of these events could not escape notice, but the light of their true explanation does not dawn upon human consciousness until the severe phenomena of the sixth seal arrive. So what is the correct interpretation of Revelation 6 verses 16 and 17? 
The incorrect interpretation is people are saying the wrath of God is now imminent. And Robert Thomas is saying that's not what's being said here at all. The pagans, the unbelievers on the earth at the time, for the very first time, they're recognizing, oh my goodness, these things that are happening to us, these are indeed the wrath of God. And in fact, when they say the wrath of God has come, the statement backs up and includes everything in the chapter where the unbelievers themselves acknowledge that yes, the wrath of God has come, but the wrath of God actually started with the opening of the first seal, which would include the Antichrist and the famines and the earthquakes. So it's a massive difference of opinion regarding how Revelation 6 verses 16 and 17 is being treated. When it says the wrath of God has come, is that a statement looking forward to wrath yet to come, or is it a statement looking backward? Our view is is a statement looking backward. Their view is it's sort of a statement looking forward. That's a major difference of opinion that we have with these folks. Now, this quote by Gerald Stanton, um, I have not given to you before, so let me read this. It says, uh, Rosenthal... He's the pre-wrath advocate. Constantly asserts that the outpoured wrath of God does not commence until Revelation 8 verse 1. The seventh seal which immediately introduces the unprecedented judgments of the seven trumpets. Even the most casual reading of Revelation 6 verses 12 through 17 reveals that the cry of verses 16 and 17 um, is a scream of terror from the wicked, rebellious human leaders who have endured war and famine and death and destruction and a shattering earthquake and a frightful disruption of heavenly bodies under the earlier judgments. Obviously they are responding, Stanton says I think correctly, obviously they are responding to judgment, to past judgment and not judgments yet to come. Rosenthal says it's a statement about wrath yet to come. Stanton is saying no. The pagans are acknowledging that the wrath of God has come. And in fact, it already started at the beginning of the chapter. Stanton goes on and he says, For wicked men have no ability to speak a prophecy. Interesting point. It is true that the heiress tense, and this is where Rosenthal is banking a lot of his argument on the heiress tense. It is true that the heiress tense normally has no time significance, but the verb elethin is in the heiress tense and indicative mood, and when this occurs, it refers to a past action and not to a future action. Now you'll notice there in brackets, Stanton quotes a very well-known Greek lexicon. This is a classic. Uh, Dana and Manti, a manual grammar for the Greek New Testament. And Stanton goes on and he says, hence the proper translation is the great day of his wrath is to come or as, the, or as the vast majority of translators put it, the great day of their wrath has come. It is a major error to force the translation to declare that the great day of his wrath will come. The pre-wrath people are saying that's a statement of wrath that's imminent yet future. And we're saying, no, the wrath of God already started. And Stanton and Thomas are arguing that's what the Greek grammar uh, advocates. He goes on here and he says it is a major error to force the translation to declare the great day of his wrath will come. One can only conclude that this strong reference to the wrath of God is the direct response of the wicked to their shattering expectation under the first seals and not a veiled prophecy of coming judgment. Now, why would I bore you with all this stuff? I bore you with it for this reason. When you listen to pre-wrath 
advocates, they are completely and totally convinced that the Greek grammar is on their side. Uh, what they want the passage to say is the, the wrath of God is imminent and the wrath of God is coming. The fact of the matter is there is a lot of Greek scholars like Thomas and Stanton quoting Dana and Manti, a classic Greek grammar, arguing that that is not what the Greek text is saying. What the Greek text is actually saying is the wrath of God has come and in fact it already started. So if the latter is true and the wrath of God already started at the beginning of the chapter in Revelation chapter 6 verse 1 and we as the church are promised an exemption from divine wrath, guess what folks? You can't be here for seal judgment number one, can you? Because that's the wrath of God. You can't be here for seal judgment number two either. Why not? Because that's the wrath of God also. And it gets better. You can't be here for seal judgment number three. Or seal judgment number four. Or seal judgment number five. Or seal judgment number six. Because all of them, if Thomas and Stanton are correct here, all of them represent the wrath of God. But the pre-wrath view, because of their vociferous nature, has so many people somehow convinced that the Greek is completely on their side. And if you listen to them talk, you would think every single Greek scholar that's ever walked the face of the earth would agree with them. And I bring up some things to show you that isn't, that isn't true. You, you produce your Greek scholar, I'll produce my Greek scholar. And a lot of Greek scholars at the end of the day would blatantly disagree with what Marvin Rosenthal and company is doing with Revelation 6, verses 16 and 17. Now, having said all that, take a look at Revelation 6 and notice verses 3 and 4. I want to spend just a couple of minutes here looking at seal judgment number 2, war, and seal judgment number 3, famine, which pre-wrath advocates say are not the wrath of God. Now look at this here. Revelation 6 verses 3 and 4, what does it say? And he, who's the he? It would be Jesus causing these things. So man is not causing these things. Satan is not causing these things. Jesus is causing these things. When he broke the second seal, I heard the second living creature saying, Come, and I saw a red horse that went out to him who sat on it, and it was granted to take peace from the earth, and that men would slay each other, and a great, what's the next word? Great sword was given to them, or given to him. You should take that word sword, and you should underline it. Because the pre-wrath people say, this is not God's wrath. And I'm going to show you from the Old Testament that it is God's wrath. Uh, look at the third seal judgment, Revelation 6, verses 5 and 6. When he broke the third seal, I heard the third living creature say, Come, and I looked, and behold, a black horse. And he sat on it with a pair of scales in his hands. And I heard something like a voice at the center of the four living creatures saying, A quart of wheat for a denarius, and three quarts of barley for a denarius, and do not damage the oil and the wine. Now, what has happened here, and in our Revelation series that we did at this church, we go into a lot more details about it, but worldwide famine has broken out. The pre-wrath people are saying the famine is not God's wrath. So the sword is not God's wrath, and the famine is not God's wrath either. And what I want to show you is it's almost as if these pre-wrath advocates put their view together without consulting the rest of the Bible. Because I'm going to show you countless passages from the Old Testament where both famine that God causes 
and sword that God causes, it's, it's uncategorically the wrath of God. There's no if, ands, or buts about it. There's no way around this. So, Job 19, verse 29. Then be afraid of the sword for yourselves. For wrath brings the punishment of the sword that you may know there is judgment. Now, do you see the word sword there? I hope you do, because I've got an underline. God is bringing the sword. Do you see the word wrath there? Somebody say something. Just for my self-confidence, if nothing else. I mean, very clearly, God is bringing a judgment. It's described as a sword, and it's described as God's wrath. So how in the world could Marvin Rosenthal and company tell you that the sword in Revelation 6 verse 4 that Jesus is causing by opening the various seals on the seven sealed scroll bringing these judgments is not God's wrath. I mean did Marvin Rosenthal put his view together without consulting Job 19 verse 29. And this is just the tip of the iceberg with these people. Notice uh, 2 Chronicles 36 Verses 16 and 17. But they continually mocked the messengers of God, despised his words, scoffed at his prophets, until the wrath of the Lord rose against his people. This is Israel, not the church. Until there was no remedy. So he set up against them the king of the Chaldeans, who killed their young men with the sword in the house of their sanctuary and had no compassion on young man or virgin, old man or frail. He handed them all over to him. So what is happening here is God is finally saying, okay, to the nation of Israel, you've rejected my prophets long enough. I'm sending you into the Babylonian captivity. I'm raising up the king of the Chaldeans to come against you with a sword. So do you see this as the wrath of God? You should because it's described there as the wrath of the Lord. And do you see the word sword there? You should because I've got it underlined. And notice that God is bringing his wrath with a sword. And you'll notice that he's using a, what do I call him? A third party to do it. The king of the Chaldeans. The king of Babylon. Now, this is very important because the pre-wrath people are saying, no, the Antichrist in Revelation 6 is causing these issues, not God. If it said God was causing these issues, it would be God directly rather than the Antichrist coming forward as if God can't use a secondary agent to execute his wrath. And here clearly in the Old Testament, you see that God brings his wrath through a secondary agent the king of Babylon, and the king of Babylon executing God's wrath brings the sword. So if the sword here is God's wrath, then how can Marvin Rosenthal say in Revelation chapter 6 verse 4 that the sword there is not God's wrath? You follow? I mean, it's almost like he put the view together without considering all these other passages. And I'm just getting started here. I mean, you guys are going to be just totally worn out by the time we finish this. But what else is new? Amen? Notice Isaiah 51, verses 19 and 20. These two things have happened to you. Who will mourn for you? The devastation, destruction, famine. Now, famine is in sealed judgment three, right? And sword is in seal judgment too. Famine and sword. Famine and sword. Sword and famine. Pretty good title for a movie, right? How shall I comfort you? Your sons have fainted. They lie helpless at the head of every street like an antelope full of, oh my goodness, what does it say here? The wrath of the Lord. The rebuke of your God. So you'll notice very clearly here that famine and sword that God brings is his wrath. So if that's true, then how can Marvin Rosenthal say that 
seal judgment three, famine, is not God's wrath. Because I don't see the word wrath there. And how can he say that seal judgment two, the sword, is not God's wrath? Because I don't see the word wrath there. Why would John have to say that when the Old Testament clearly tells you that famine and sword that God brings is the wrath of God? And here is part of the problem with people approaching the book of Revelation. They say, I want to study, they say it like this, I want to study Revelations. Now, right then and there, you know there's a problem because that's not even the title of the book. It's the revelation of Jesus Christ. It's, not a, it's a singular noun, apocalypsis. And they're so excited about studying Revelations that they rush into the book without understanding the Old Testament. And if you're in that business where you're trying to read the book of Revelation and you're not filtering it through the grid of the Old Testament, then you're not going to come up with the proper interpretation of the book because the Old Testament concepts are refiltered in the book of Revelation constantly. In fact, the book of Revelation has in it 404 verses 278 of which are references or allusions to the Old Testament. And so John and the Holy Spirit are already expecting, based on our knowledge of the Old Testament, that we can connect famine and sword that God brings to his wrath without having to restate the obvious. Because it's already mentioned in the Old Testament. Uh, Notice, if you will, Jeremiah chapter 21, verses 5 through 7 and verse 9. I don't know if I need to read all of these verses, but do you see the word anger and wrath and indignation there? Somebody say yes, Yes. even if you don't see them. (laughs) We can do audience participation every once in a while. Anger, wrath, and indignation. I mean, is there any doubt that what Jeremiah is speaking of here is the wrath of God? There's no doubt about it at all because it mentions anger, wrath, and indignation. Well, in the same passage, it mentions sword and famine, not just once, but twice. So sword and famine that God brings can very clearly be his, what? Anger, wrath, and and indignation. So when I see seal judgment number three, sword, seal judgment number four, famine, and I don't see the word wrath there, I don't have to say, well, that's just the wrath of Satan and the wrath of man, but not the wrath of God, because I know the book of Jeremiah. And Jeremiah equates the two. Notice uh, Jeremiah chapter 44 and verse eight, provoking me to what? Anger. Now, is this God's wrath? You can, I'll tell you what, we can just do sign language. Just go thumbs up or thumbs down. Is this God's wrath here? Thumbs up. There we go. And you continue through the passage and it describes God's wrath as sword, famine, and then it says sword and famine. So if sword and famine that God brings can represent his anger, then why can't I see the wrath of God in seal judgment two, sword, and seal judgment number three, famine? No problem at all. Notice Jeremiah chapter 50, verse 13. Now, because of the wrath of the Lord, she will not be inhabited. Do we see God's wrath here? Thumbs up or thumbs down? Good. What do you also see here? Armory. That's a sword, right? Weapons. That's a sword. Indignation. That represents his wrath. So quite clearly, sword that God brings can be his wrath. Well, if that's true in Jeremiah 50, why can't it be true in Revelation chapter 6, verse 4? Notice Ezekiel chapter 7, verses 14 and 15. They have blown the trumpet. 
and made everything ready, but no one is going to battle, for my wrath is against the, their multitude. Now, is this the wrath of God? Thumbs up or thumbs down? Thumbs up. Kind of like those things on Facebook. You click the thing and it goes like that. So thumbs up. This is clearly the wrath of God. The next verse calls God's wrath sword. There's 15, Ezekiel 7. Famine. And if that weren't enough, it repeats it. Sword and famine. So sword and famine that God brings as judgment clearly is his wrath. So if his, if his wrath is connected to sword and famine in Ezekiel 7, then what, what's the problem of seeing sword and famine as his wrath? In seal judgment number two and seal judgment number three. Now, take a look at Revelation chapter 6, verse 8. Here now, we're looking at seal judgment 4. We just spent a little time on seal judgments 2 and 3. But what does seal judgment number 4 say? I looked, and behold, an ashen horse, and the one who sat on it had the name Death and Hades. Or had the name Death, rather. And Hades was following him. Authority was given to him over a quarter of the earth to kill with sword, famine, plague, and wild animals on the earth. So what wipes out a quarter of the world's population with the opening of, what is this, seal judgment number four? What wipes out a quarter of the world's population is a sword and a famine and a plague and wild animals. So the sword, the famine, the plague, and the wild animals, four things, are turned loose and at this particular time in human history, 25% of the world's population is destroyed. Now, pre-wrath people, they'll say, that's not the wrath of God. That's the wrath of man, but not the wrath of, that's the wrath of man or the wrath of Satan, but not the wrath of God. So we're going to be here for this judgment. That's their argument. Well, once again, what saith the Old Testament? Notice Ezekiel Chapter 5, verses 15 through 17. So it shall be a reproach, a taunt, a lesson, and an astonishment to the nations that are all around when I execute my judgments among you in anger, in fury, and in furious rebukes. Now, would you say this is the wrath of God here? Thumbs up or thumbs down? Thumbs up. You guys are actually getting really good at this. But notice the next verse describes God's wrath, which is unambiguous, because it says anger, fury, furious. There's no doubt that this passage is speaking of the execution of God's wrath. But then the next verse talks about how God is bringing his wrath. Famine is mentioned once, twice, three times wild beasts, and sword. So if famine mentioned three times, wild beasts and sword is the wrath of God in Ezekiel chapter five, then how in the world can Marvin Rosenthal say it's not the wrath of God? In Revelation chapter six, verse eight, which also mentions sword, famine, plague, and wild animals. I mean, why didn't John, this is their argument, why didn't John say it was the wrath of God? And my response is John wouldn't have to. Because he's assuming that his readers have already read Ezekiel 7. And to say it's the wrath of God would just be to stating, would just be to stating the obvious. That's why I say I think what they did in their hurry to get this view out is they assembled it really fast. And they did not consult the Old Testament, which you have to understand to interpret the book of Revelation correctly. So we're done, right? No, not even close. Have we done this? Ezekiel 7. Do you see this is the wrath of God? Thumbs up or thumbs down? Thumbs up, wrath of God. Because it mentions fury, anger, 
my, not just anger, my anger, my fury, mentioned twice, and then in the same passage it mentions sword, plague, and famine. And if that weren't clear enough, it mentions all three again, sword, plague, and famine. So if sword, plague, and famine are clearly the wrath of God in Ezekiel 7, then why aren't sword, plague, and famine also not the wrath of God in Revelation chapter 6, verse 8? Notice Ezekiel chapter 14, verses 19 through 21. Or I send a pestilence into their land and pour out my fury on it and cut off from it man and beast. Now would you say Ezekiel 14 is the wrath of God? Thumbs up or thumbs down? I got to throw a trick question at some point, right? Because this is just too easy. Clearly this is the wrath of God. No ambiguity about it. You keep reading and it describes God's wrath as sword, famine, wild beasts, and pestilence. Oh my goodness, we don't just have two of the three or one of the three, excuse me, one of the four, two of the four, three of the four. We've got all four here. We've got exactly what Revelation 6 verse 8 says. Because Revelation 6 verse 8 mentions sword, famine, wild beasts, and pestilence. So if those are clearly the wrath of God in Ezekiel 14, then quite obviously they are also the wrath of God in Revelation 6 verse 8. Because John expects that when you read Revelation 6 verse 8, you've already read Ezekiel 14. See, it's very interesting. Um, <laughs> There's a promise in the book of Revelation that says this. If you read this book and heed it, you'll be blessed. Does anybody here not want to be blessed? We all want to be blessed. So how do you get blessed? You read and heed the book of Revelation. And I have spent a lot of time trying to figure out what the blessing is. Because it doesn't tell you what the blessing is. So people spill all this ink explaining what the blessing is. I don't think any of them are right. I think little old me knows what the blessing is. And here is my theory on what the blessing is. If you start studying the book of Revelation, you're going to have to start studying Ezekiel. And you're going to have to start studying Isaiah. And you're going to have to start studying Jeremiah. And you're going to have to start studying the book of Job. In fact, you're going to have to start studying the book of Genesis. And the book of Exodus. And the book of Leviticus. You get, you get my direction here? That's the blessing. If you take the book of Revelation seriously, it automatically makes you a student of the prior 65 books... Because Revelation has in it 404 verses, 278 are allusions to the Old Testament. So to make any sense of the book of Revelation, you have to be a student of the Old Testament. There's no if, ands, or buts about it. So God did a very dirty trick on yours truly. God, when I first got saved, gave me an interest in the end times. And I was one of those Christians that says, let's study the book of Revelations and let's, let's go to work here. And then you start reading it and you say, well, that passage doesn't make sense. I have to look at my note here on the margin in my study Bible and that took me in the Old Testament. Oh, I guess I need to study an Old Testament passage to understand what's going on here in Revelation. And that happened with me at point after point after point after point to the, to the point where I said to, finally to myself, you know what, I just need to read the whole Bible. <laughs> to make any sense of the book of Revelation, which God has given me a desire to learn. That's the blessing in my humble opinion. Uh, you become a tremendous student of the whole Bible. And you can see through silly arguments like these given by pre-wrath rapturists. Because it's obvious to me that they are interpreting Revelation 
without the grid of the Old Testament or else they wouldn't be making all of these mistakes. This is the danger of specialists. Tim LaHaye asked me one time, do you wanna be a specialist or do you wanna be a generalist? And I thought, well, what's the difference? A specialist knows more and more and more about less and less and less. That's a specialist. A generalist is the opposite. He knows less and less and less about more and more and more. See the difference? So when it came to picking my major in seminary, I decided to major not in Old Testament, not in New Testament, but in the whole Bible. They have a department there at Dallas Seminary called Bible Exposition. Because I really didn't want, at the end of the day, to be a specialist. I didn't want to be someone that knows more and more and more about less and less and less. And when you listen to these pre-wrath rapturists talk, they tout their degrees about Greek and all of these kinds of things. And the problem is they've done so much exegesis that now there's been an exit of Jesus. Where they're so myopically focused on what is being said in Revelation 6 verse 8 that they're not considering everything else that God said beforehand. That is the problem of entrusting theology exclusively to the domain of specialists. Because a specialist by nature knows more and more and more about less and less and less. In fact, a lot of these New Testament scholars may not even put these verses together because they're myopically looking at how many veins are there on the leaves of the tree, forgetting what the whole forest looks like. And I think specialists have their place, but you have to understand that God's word is all 66 books. The book of Revelation is not meant to be understood or studied, chopping it off from everything that God had revealed thus far. And the pre-wrath people, for whatever reason, in my opinion, are doing just that. That's why they're making these basic errors. Notice Ezekiel 7 verse 19. Their silver and their gold will not be able to deliver them in the day of the wrath of the Lord. Now, would you say that this is the wrath of the Lord? Thumbs up or thumbs down? Clearly thumbs up. How, how clear can it get? The day of the wrath of the Lord. Now, what does it go on to describe here in the same verse? They will not satisfy their souls nor fill their stomachs. That's a famine, isn't it? So you'll notice here in Ezekiel chapter 7 verse 19 that a famine that God says is called his wrath. If a famine that God sends is called his wrath in Ezekiel chapter 7 verse 19, then how in the world could I see a famine in Revelation chapter 6 verse 8 that Jesus is causing by opening a seven sealed scroll and not conclude that's also the wrath of God? It's obviously the wrath of God because Ezekiel connects the two. And if that's the wrath of God in Revelation 6 verse 8, pre-wrath people have a problem because everything they're teaching is wrong. They're teaching the church is going to be here for that seal. And I'm saying the church won't be here for that seal. The church can't be here for that seal because that seal, along with all of the others, is a manifestation of God's wrath. And the Bible predicts that we are exempted from God's wrath. Um, you'll notice here in Ezekiel 14 that it's also called the day of the Lord. The famine is called the day of the Lord. That's certainly not how they have their prophecy charts drawn. Because they say the day of the Lord is the final 25%, give or take. When the famine has already transpired. So they've got a definition of the day of the Lord, which is obviously unbiblical. You know, it's way, it's way too narrow. Well, what about death? You guys want to talk about death for a minute? 
What does Revelation chapter 6 verse 8 says, say? And, and you thought COVID was bad. COVID, what is the death rate? One, one less than 1% of people infected actually die from COVID. And I understand there's a lot of, there's people in high risk categories and they'll, they'll do whatever they can to stay away from it. And I get that and I understand that. But statistically, let's just be honest with ourselves here for a minute. You've got a better chance of being killed in the car driving to church than you've got being infected and die from COVID at church. So if you really want to take these statistics and use them consistently, then we shouldn't even get in the car. Because don't you know, when people get in the car, they could die? Isn't that what we're told all the time? Don't you know, if you don't social distance and you don't have your mask on, you could die. Well, I, I could die eating the eggs that my wife fed me this morning too fast. <laughs> well, I, I could, right? I could die. So that's one excuse for going on my diet, I guess. I got a diet because I could die. And I'm thinking of that verse. They, they picked up, some of you are mad at me. They picked up stones to stone him to death. <laughs> so th this, is, this is talking about here the death of not just 1%. This is talking about the death of a quarter of the world's population. So COVID, as as bad as it is, is not one of the seal judgments. Amen? Revelation chapter 6, verse 8 says, I looked and behold an ashen horse, and the one who sat on it had the name Death and Hades. Death and Hades was following with him. Authority was given to them over a quarter of the earth to kill with the sword, and famine, and plague, and the wild animals of the earth. Now, you'll notice here that with this particular seal judgment, death and Hades metaphorically break out and they kill a quarter of the world's population. And then you keep moving from that, what was that, Revelation 6 verse 8, you keep moving into the next seal judgment, which is martyrdoms. So by the time you hit seal judgment four, and by the time you hit seal judgment number five, you've got massive deaths. A quarter of the world's population has been destroyed, and massive martyrdoms have taken place to the point where the martyrs are portrayed as being under the altar of God, crying out to God, you know, for vengeance following their deaths. I mean, it's just massive, massive death that has happened. And pre-wrath rapturists will look you straight in the eye and say those two things have nothing to do with God's wrath, but they have everything to do with man's wrath or Satan's wrath. And my question for them is, well, have you read the beginning of the book of Revelation? Because not only is Revelation set up in such a way that you have to consult the Old Testament to understand it, you can't read Revelation 6 until you read Revelation 1. This is going to be heavy. You ready for this? Revelation 1 comes before Revelation 6. Now, I know that's why you come to Sugarland Bible Church, to get these nuggets that you can't get anywhere else. So if you don't learn anything in this series, just know this, Revelation 1 comes before Revelation 6. That's how God designed it. So I can't understand Revelation 6 until I've read Revelation 1. Revelation 6 is talking about death. And pre-wrath rapturists are basically saying that has nothing to do with God's wrath. My question is, has you, have you read Revelation 1? What does Revelation chapter 1 verse 18 say? Jesus speaking, I am he who lives and was dead and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. We just commemorated that last week, right? Resurrection Sunday. He was dead. Now he's alive. 
I am he who lives and was dead, and behold, I am alive forever. Amen. I have the keys. Now, what are the keys? The keys are what open the door. I have the keys of death and Hades. So when you read Revelation chapter 6 verse 8, and death and Hades have now broken out over the earth, destroying a quarter of the world's population, what is your logical inference as to who caused death and Hades to come forth? Any hints? Starts with a J. Ends in Jesus. <laughs> Jesus caused the death in Hades. Is that, is, that a, is that an unfounded conclusion? No. It would seem odd if my whole life was spent writing a dissertation on Revelation 6. And I, I understood everything there was to know about Revelation 6. And I wasn't factoring in Revelation 1 to understand Revelation 6. So by the time you get to Revelation 6 and you see death in Hades destroying a quarter of the world's population, you say, oh, Jesus is causing that. Why is Jesus causing that? Because I read Revelation 1, which comes before Revelation 6, which indicates that Jesus is the one that has the keys of death and Hades. I mean, it's quite obvious that Jesus is causing death and Hades. So if Jesus is causing death and Hades, and the church has promised an exemption from the wrath of the Lamb, how could the church be on the earth when this is happening? Are you with me? So all of this to say, don't buy this argument that somehow these earlier sealed judgments are not God's wrath. They clearly are. You don't have to see the word wrath in every single uh, paragraph to conclude it's God's wrath. You can conclude it's God's wrath just by factoring Revelation 1 into Revelation 6. You can conclude it's God's wrath by becoming a student of the Old Testament which links over and over again all of these judgments to the wrath of God. So let me get to today what I really wanted to talk about. So that was my intro. And now we're one minute over, so I didn't even get to my message today. So come back next week and we'll get to what's really important. All right, let's pray. Father, we're grateful for today, grateful for your truth, your word. Help us to rightly divide your word in these last days where there's a lot of end times confusion. We'll be careful to give you all the praise and the glory. We ask these things in Jesus' name and God's people said, amen. Uh, cheer up. Now that we're finished with the wrath of God, the flood is next.